the RFID chips themselves, these tiny little devices, in and of themselves, even if you did number everything and stick one of those in there, it would be difficult to actually know what the contents of the chip were. So the, the tiny chips, let me just explain the technology here. The tiny chips with their own unique identifying numbers are hooked up to antennas. The antennas look, they, this is one example of uh, an RFID antenna. You see the tiny little chip there in the center and it's hooked up to some metal coil or metal uh, flattened metal wire that serves as an antenna. These antennas can take a variety of different shapes. Sometimes they look like children's mazes uh, and what we'll be talking about later, sometimes they look even like spray on ink or foil. Now the way this functions is that let's envision that we have um, a shoe. And we'll be talking about this shoe a little bit later on specifically. But let's say that we have a shoe and we want to number this particular item. We can stick a label or a tag on it with a barcode, but then that would not distinguish it from every other shoe that is also produced by the Soho brand and is a size 8. The barcode would be the same for all of those shoes. If we put a unique identifying number using one of these RFID chips and an antenna on it, we can assign it its own unique number. Now the question becomes how do we read it? And the way the technology works is reader devices in the environment, which are about the size of, uh, I've seen them about the size of a hardback book. A reader device would send out a constant pulse of electromagnetic energy. The electromagnetic energy would be picked up by the antenna. It would then stimulate the little chip to say, here I am, I'm chip number 03842797, et cetera, et cetera, 96, you know, 96 um, different digits of, of length there. And it would send that information back out to the reader device, which would then pick it up and say, aha, I just detected an item. Here's the number of it. Now let me look it up in the database. And looking it up in the database, you can say, oh, that's a pair of shoes that was bought at a Walmart store on June 15th using credit card number 604A29. So that's that. in a nutshell, that's how the technology is designed to work. And now we'll be talking about some of the nuts and bolts of that. All right, so we've got the world's smallest RFID chip. Now, again, remember that the chip in and of itself simply contains the number. It does need to be hooked up to some form of antenna so that it can be stimulated by one of those reader devices that would hit it with energy. Now, the technology, again, being designed by Procter and Gamble and Gillette, and by the way, this Auto ID Center at MIT now has 103 sponsors, including some of the biggest consumer product manufacturers in the world, including companies like Philip Morris, Coca-Cola, Pfizer, uh, Walmart, Home Depot, big companies and including government agencies such as the Department of Defense and the United States Postal Service and also UPS. So, um, you know, they're, they're serious about this and they're putting a lot of money into it and now there's 103 companies working on this. Now, their stated goal is to use this technology to replace the barcode, to literally put one of these numbering devices on every physical item manufactured on planet Earth in every country, in every factory rolling off of every assembly line. Now, replacing the barcode means a couple of things. And let's talk about the difference between this technology and barcode technology. Um, every pack of gum, the Dentine is owned by Pfizer, which is one of the uh, sponsors of this auto ID center. Um, we'll get to that one in a second. Now, the, there are a couple of ways that we need to be concerned about this replacing the barcode. The barcode, as we said earlier, would have the same barcode image and the same UPC number for every can of Coke. So if I've got a can of Coke up here in the podium and you've got one back there and maybe a couple in your fridge at home, all of those cans of Coke would contain the very same UPC number. Now what that means is when you purchased it and you scanned your supermarket loyalty card or you scanned your credit card, which is now how they're recording your data, uh, using the infrastructure created by the supermarket card, now they can use your credit card to record the same information, even if you don't have a loyalty card. So what would be recorded when you scan your grocery card or your, um, your credit card would be simply the fact that you bought a six-pack of Coke, not which Cokes. With this new system, every single one of those cans of Coke would have a unique number associated with it, and each one of those six numbers in that six-pack of Coke would go into a database unless we do something to prevent it. The default state of how this information is recorded in order to ring up the sale would record your name and your purchase, your, your identity, along with those six individual numbers on those cans of Coke. Now, what would that mean? Well, let's say down the road, one of those cans of Coke, I don't know, the guy picking up your garbage is careless, and he lets one of them roll down the street. 
and let's say the litter police come along the next day and they pick up that can of Coke, they can actually run a reader over it, figure out its unique identifying number, look it up in a database, and see that you were the person making the purchase. And you could get, oh, I don't know, an automatic littering ticket in the mail. Worse yet, let's say that uh, someone snuck by when your garbage was out on the curb and stole that piece of trash and took that can of Coke and planted it at a crime scene with your fingerprints on it. Now it gets scanned, and you get a knock on the door ask, uh, from someone asking, what's your alibi for you know, the evening of uh, the 15th? So that, that's just one way in which this is different from a UPC barcode in that it creates, in essence, a registration system for physical items. Now, d depending on your politics, I don't know where folks listening to this uh, stand on guns, but there has been some real concern about registration of guns. And one of the arguments that's, co that's commonly used to argue against registration of guns is the fact that in countries where registration of guns has been carried out in the past, oftentimes registration leads to forms of control. Now, if it's guns, maybe that's one thing. If it becomes food, that becomes a very serious issue. Um, recording of items based on my own uh, extensive research of history and looking at uh, totalitarian regimes throughout the 20th century, I think that there are many uh, evil governments that would have loved the opportunity to record what everyone bought in uh, the hopes of being able at some point to control those purchases or those items down the road. Now, there are actually three ways in which this technology is different from the barcode. We just talked about the first one, in that every item would have a unique identifying number. The second way in which uh, these are fundamentally different from a barcode is the way that creates massive privacy problems. And that is that unlike a barcode, where if you hold an item up, you've got to actually put it up to the barcode reader and actually get a read off of it. You need a, what's called a line of sight to where the reader actually sees the barcode device. Um, with an RFID chip, when we call them spy chips. With a spy chip, you can actually read through someone's clothing. You can read through their suitcase. You can read through their purse, through their backpack, through their briefcase, through their pocket, through their wallet, through their clothes. So the things that we normally count on to provide us with privacy protection, you don't want somebody to see something, you put it in a bag. You don't want somebody to know how much money you're carrying, you put it in your wallet, you put your wallet in your purse. You don't want the criminal down the, you know, hanging out in the corner to know you're carrying a $600 camcorder, you put it in a bag and you sling it over your shoulder. You don't go carrying things out in plain sight. This technology removes the privacy that humankind has had forever, which is the fact that you cannot see through things. People don't have x-ray vision. This provides criminals, uh, marketers, uh, unscrupulous people running stores, um, unscrupulous governments with the opportunity to bypass what most of us would consider privacy protection and actually see through our clothes, even down to the size and color of our underwear if someone chose to do that, if they have an access to one of these reader devices. So the fact that they can be read with, uh, through items, the other problem, they can be read without your knowledge, the reader devices are silent. They can be undetected, they can be hidden in doorways, they can be hidden in floors, they can be embedded into floor tiles, woven into carpet. These reader devices can exist pretty much anywhere, and you would have no way of knowing it was there and no way of knowing that it was reading you and detecting what you were carrying. And the other problem with this is that these devices can read these tags at a distance. In some cases, the distance is only a couple of inches, in some cases, that distance can be 20, even 30 feet away. So if let's, let's fast forward 10 years, and let's say that everything you're wearing and carrying is equipped with one of these devices. And I have a reader up here at the podium. I could actually, without you knowing, flip it on, get a total inventory of every single thing in this room, and you would never be the wiser. So I would know everything that uh, what you, you were wearing or carrying. Now, we'll talk uh, a little bit later about read range, about whether it's 2 inches or 30 feet and how that affects privacy. And one of the things you may think of right off the bat is, well, what good would it do me to know every single item in this room instead of knowing every single item that you personally were carrying? And we'll get to that in a minute. All right. Now, this technology is not science fiction. It is happening right now. Already, companies are heavily invested in this. There are a number of companies that have already done trials in real stores, in real Walmart and Target stores in the United States, in Home Depot stores as well, uh, also in a chain in England called Tesco and in a chain in Germany called Metro. We have reason to suspect that a number of other retailers have been participating in these trials. But shoppers in those stores have actually picked up items with these tags and purchased them and taken them home with them without knowing 